I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the reason we're here today is because that is the closest thing to each of our hearts. It's the most dear and precious thing to each of us that we can worship God, not just in our churches on Sunday, but with our lives every day. It's an honor to be here on this beautiful day, and I hope I haven't lost all my credentials as a physician by forgetting sunscreen. <laughs> I hope to redeem myself. I'd like to begin with a question, two questions actually. First of all, how many of you here would consider yourselves Christian or religious? And how many of you here would consider yourselves feminist? Well, it's not very many. <laughs> So the reason I ask that is that a few weeks ago, a friend of mine said something surprising to me. He said that in his opinion, 90% of the problems in the world were caused by men. Naturally, I disagreed with him. I told him he underestimated. <laughs> if that is true, then more of us need to become feminist or redefine feminism or perhaps both. Let me explain. The issue that prompted this gathering is the Department of Health and Human Services mandate that requires all employers to provide health insurance that covers contraception. Controversy about the mandate from religious groups has created a bit of a debate within a debate. Is objection to the mandate a defense of religious liberty or is it an assault on women's rights? Religious organizations have claimed the former, and women's groups the latter. But this dichotomy defines the real issue. Why are religious groups not considered women's rights groups? The answer, I think, is that we have let those who oppose us define us. And they have defined us by our no. No to contraception and no to abortion. While these restrictions are indeed part of our philosophy, our, of our philosophy, they do not define our philosophy. Our philosophy is defined by scripture, which demands that a man love his wife as Christ loved the church and be willing to lay down his life for her. Our philosophy is defined in Catholic theology by modeling our reverence for Mary as a model for reverence of all women. Our philosophy, I say, is eminently positive. Let me give you an example. Recently a young woman came into my office to be tested for STDs. As I obtained an appropriate history, I asked if she was faithful with her partner. She responded almost with pride that she had been faithful with the same partner for the past two years. Then I asked if her partner was faithful. She acknowledged that he was not. Then I said, how does it make you feel that as you entrust to him the most intimate aspect of your, of your life, he betrays that trust? Her eyes welled up. Then I asked, what would happen if you got pregnant? And she acknowledged that he would probably leave, and the tears began to flow. At this point, I had to fight back my own tears, as I tried to build up her self-esteem and let her know that she had value and she had options. Now, I acknowledge that it would be best for this woman not to get pregnant in this situation. I acknowledge that our values will never be fully incorporated into our culture. But would this woman really be better served by a pill 
than she would by a reminder that her dignity comes not from her sexuality, but as a unique and precious gift from God, and by working with her to develop the self-esteem necessary to make different choices. The HHS mandate is based on an ideology that defines women's rights as reproductive rights and access to contraception. In opposing this mandate, we are not trying to reverse women's access to these reproductive services, but we are defining our right to offer an alternative ideology that is consistent with our moral theology and with our desire to protect the dignity of women. Primarily, we must counter the devaluing of women. If we don't, who will? Ours is the agenda that is capable of reversing the dehumanizing effects of pornography. Ours is the agenda that is capable of combating human trafficking. Ours is the agenda that is capable of taking the lead against domestic violence. Ours is the agenda that has spearheaded the battle against abortion. We must apply our positive feminist agenda publicly and effectively so that even those who disagree with our position will still have to acknowledge our efforts. That is our mandate, and that is why it is important for us to prevail. Now with freedom comes responsibility. And having said that, I'm going to challenge us a little bit. As a physician, I can tell you that when properly implemented, abstinence, monogamy, and natural family planning compose the healthiest approach to sexuality. Still, there is a stark reality from which we cannot run. Contraception was not just something developed by bad people wanting to do bad things to women. Rather, it was developed because bad things were happening to women. Out of wedlock pregnancy, teen pregnancy, STDs, rape and abortion. And these bad things are still happening today. Changing our culture will take time. And many women, like the one I mentioned, are in need of help now. While we cannot sacrifice our moral philosophy, we must be more innovative and resourceful about finding morally acceptable approaches to help women, and we also must be more effective at, implement, at implementing the approaches we have. Ultimately, this issue will be decided through political or judicial processes. As these processes evolve, I think it is important to remember these words. God who gave us life, gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. His justice cannot sleep forever. These words are etched indelibly in the walls of the Lincoln Memorial, and I pray they also remain etched forever in our hearts. Thank you very much. We invite you to use your voices now. Let's be heard.